Well, good morning again. This morning we have a really awesome privilege to have John Talley with us this morning. About two years ago, I took a trip with some other pastors in the valley, and we went out to L.A. to uh, see some different ministries, to learn from some folks of how they're doing ministry, how they're approaching it. And I got set with John and two other guys in a car where we discussed the finer points of theology, like who was better, Michael Jordan or LeBron James, and spent a good portion of our time just going back and forth on that. Uh, but John is, is a gift to me. He is the executive pastor at Roosevelt Community Church in downtown Phoenix, and he is uh, in the final stretch of his time at Phoenix Seminary. Stay strong, my man. We've all been there. So it was, uh, it was fortuitous. We just asked John, said, John, will you come up and teach? And he was very gracious in saying that he would come up and teach for us this week. And so he is going to continue in our Matthew series uh, going through. Uh, and so would you guys welcome John Talley up to the stage? Uh, well, good morning. Uh, it is a joy and privilege to be able to, to be here at Heritage Church, coming all the way from downtown Phoenix. And uh, I'd like to publicly express my appreciation for uh, Pastor Jason, Pastor Blake, and the elders here for allowing me to come and preach the word, to preach the word of God. Uh, Pastor Blake is right. We did talk about the finer points of theology, and I've concluded that Michael Jordan was the GOAT, the greatest person. Yeah, yeah. So there was another guy that was in the car who was a little, uh, yeah, he was a heretic. Let's just call him that. So, but now I'm excited to, to, to be here. Um, also, um, I, I know too, and particularly for everyone here, but those who are also tuning in at home, um, praise God, this is your seven year anniversary, right? I mean, praise God for that amazing uh, faithfulness and fruitfulness to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples. Um, it's a joy to be able to be here in honor to, to preach on your seven-year anniversary. So listen, I know you guys are in your Matthew series, so we're going to go ahead and just dive right in. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 28. If you have your Bibles or your phones, your tablets, your iPads, whatever the case may be, um, go ahead and open them up to Matthew 15, 21 through 28. And when you get there, just say, I got it. If you're not there yet, say, hold on, Pastor John, hold on. I want to read our Bible passage for us this morning, and then I want to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and just dive. We're going to dive in. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, the ESV, and it says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. I like to label my message this morning for your heritage. 
The faith that Jesus values. The faith that Jesus values. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We give you all of the praise and all of the glory. I thank you for the men and women and children who are here to worship you, to exalt you, to sing songs to you, to fellowship, to take communion, to celebrate, but also to hear your inerrant word. As I always ask, Lord, please hide me behind the cross so that your word would get proclaimed, your people will be encouraged, so that we can ultimately glorify you, edify your church, and advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today I want to talk from the thought of the faith that Jesus values. The Gospel of Matthew, as you know, is filled with many different people encountering Jesus in some unique way, some interesting way, some intriguing way. And when they encounter him, he does this interesting thing where he heals them. He heals them because of, one, yes, his sovereignty, right? Sovereignty meaning that he's in control, he has authority, but also because of his faith, of their faith. Because of their faith in the acts of God. Have you ever been so weak, so, so, so hopeless, so, so, so desperate, if you will, in and of yourself, and you needed outside help? You needed help from another. You needed help from somebody else of some sort. I think we all can agree, if we're honest, that we tend to be prideful, tend to be arrogant at times. We don't want help from other people. No, we can do it ourselves. That's where pride and and, and arrogance kind of seeps in. I'm sure many of you can attest to that. But our passage this morning in your sermon series is about a woman who pleads for help. She pleads for help because she knows that the only person that can fix her situation It's not her. (laughs) It's in another. It's in no other than Jesus Christ. If you don't remember anything this morning, I want to leave you at least with one thing. I want to encourage you all this morning that to have faith, to have genuine faith in Messiah Jesus, because he's the only one. that can answer your requests. Have genuine faith in Messiah Jesus, knowing that he is the only one that is able to answer your requests. The faith that Jesus values values starts by recognizing who he is. It starts by recognizing who he is. He is. Before we dive in, though, I want to start by giving a biblical theology of the many different people that you've already read, that's already been preached, and how they encounter Jesus, and Jesus heals them, and he credits their faith. So a quick biblical theology here. First, Matthew 8, 5 through 13, a, a satyrian's faith here. Satyrian was this Uh, a a commander of some sort over a a lot of soldiers, over an army. And in this particular story, it's very interesting, the satyrian knows all about authority. Pastor Jason has been preaching about that in this series, this idea of authority and who has the ultimate authority. And the satyrian knew who had authority, and as he's having this interaction and conversation with Jesus something interesting happens. Jesus says, no one in Israel that I found such faith. Talking about the satyrian. I submit to you that Jesus values faith. 
You go over to Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, and it is a paralytic. You have somebody that is somewhat disabled, someone that's not able to move as, as much and needs help, needs healing. Verse 2 says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus values faith. Matthew 9 has many different stories and many different interactions. Here we have a a girl that needed to be resurrected of some sort, and also a woman that needed to be healed. Matthew 9, verse 22, interestingly, Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Jesus values faith. Matthew 9, 28, we have two blind men. And it's interesting, if you haven't been noticing here, um, Jesus is in the business of healing. Amen? He's in the, bil- uh, in the business of, of, of restoring life to individuals. And these two blind men, Jesus is preaching, he's teaching, and he's healing. This is threefold ministry that he has here all throughout the Gospels, and particularly in Matthew. What does he say? He says, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open. Jesus values faith. If it's not clear yet, heritage, I want you to say it with me. Jesus values faith. But what type of faith? What kind of faith? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look down at verse, verses 21 through 23 with me. The first aspect, the first uh, characteristic of the faith that Jesus values is first faith that recognizes him. It's faith that recognizes him, that acknowledge who he is. What's interesting to note in this passage that we have this morning, it comes on the tail end of Jesus' interaction that he has with some people. Some people, and they're talking about the nature of of, of what is unclean, what is dirty. Jesus says, what defiles a man or a woman is not necessarily the external, but it's the internal. It's the heart that is behind it. It's very interesting. And as he leaves that situation, he goes and withdraws to Tyre and and, and Sidon. Now keep in mind, Jesus was in Galilee. This was a Jewish-based context that he was in. And he's retreating of some sort. Uh, We can maybe say he was on vacation, if you will. He, He withdraws to Tyre and and Sidon. Interestingly, that these two uh, uh, places are not Jewish territory. Uh, In fact, they're they're pagan territories. They're Gentile territories. Tyre was the uh, ancient city that ran across the Phoenician coast in antiquity. It was known as an island city. Uh, an island city that Alexander the Great actually came and, and, and conquered, and now it's more considered like a, a, pen, a peninsula of some sort. Sidon was the, the parallel town, the parallel city as well. Uh, uh, Sidon, where the woman Jezebel was actually from. See this in 1 Kings 16. Jews had this idea, or at least some Jews had this idea of some other people, some other uh, ethnic context, cultural context, they were somewhat unclean of some sort. So this is very key that, again, Jesus is coming from Galilee onto these pagan territory. We can say that Jesus is crossing cultural and ethnic boundaries when he is looking to have some type of, uh, of retreat. The first aspect of faith that Jesus 
values is you recognize him. We see this in verse 22. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed. She comes out and she's crying out for mercy. Mercy. I like the way that J.D. Otis Roberts defines the word mercy. He says that mercy is the compassion shown toward an offender or an enemy. It is a disposition to forgive or forbear. Mercy. It's the compassion shown toward an offender or an enemy. It is a disposition to forgive or forbear. And this Canaanite woman is crying out for mercy because her daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Severely means in the original language, for those who don't know, the, the New Testament was originally written in the Greek language, and the word severely has this very uh, emphatic emphasis to it. It means that she was, 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 was badly, terribly suffering under the demonic possession of this demon. Severely also means that uh, it has this idea of experiencing harm in a physical sense. So we can say that maybe this, this demon was, was tormenting her uh, of some sort. She was severely oppressed. But notice what she says. She recognizes him. She acknowledges him. O oh Lord, son of David. Again, she's a Canaanite woman. She's not Jewish. <laughs> she's in a different town geographically. But she recognizes Christ. She recognizes who he is. And she makes a, a statement, a theological statement, a biblical statement, a doctrinal statement on the identity of Christ. She says, son of David. Son of David has this idea of meaning that it's a, it's a messianic concept of the Jewish people that their Messiah would be a descendant of King David. Now, I know you guys are in the Matthew book. and I know that um, Matthew chapter 1, this is the chapter that a lot of people like skip past because they can't uh, pronounce the names in it and stuff like that. Tell the truth, shame the devil. But the genealogy shows a, a lineage, and it's showing the, the, the lineage that Christ is indeed this kingly Messiah. Matthew is also written to primarily Jewish people, right, to show the kingship of Jesus. And then after the genealogy, what happens? It starts off with the birth narrative of Jesus. So this idea of son of David is packed with theological depth that a Canaanite woman expresses. Also to mention, Canaanites and, and the Jewish people historically, they had a lot of tension. They had a lot of uh, issues. They had a lot of problems. They did not get along. <laughs> there were some ethnic tensions between these two people groups. And she recognizes who this Messiah is. She affirms a biblical truth, and interestingly, Jesus rejects her. <laughs> Jesus rejects her. I mean, after all, all she wanted was her daughter to be healed. She's coming to the one that can actually heal her daughter. She needs help. She needs deliverance. But Jesus did not answer a word. Why did he ignore her? Does that seem kind of rude? <laughs> I mean, 
We're talking about the son of God here, the son of David, the eternal son of God. Jesus doesn't say a word to her. Now, before you guys get too harsh on on Jesus, (laughs) many of the parents in the room, you guys do the same thing with your children. Right? Children may be saying something, maybe asking a weird question or whatever the case may be, and you're trying to hold on to patience, (laughs) and you just don't say a word. You ignore, to some degree, your children. Why did Jesus do that? Well, culturally speaking, Gentiles, especially women, would not normally come up to a Jewish uh, person. Some Jews considered others to be unclean, as I mentioned. So in some sense, from the customs of the day, Jesus is um, kind of following the, the, the customs of that day. But his silence even caused his disciples to, to, to beg him to just send the woman away. I don't know if they were just annoyed, they, was bug- they were annoyed by her, that she was bugging out, or whatever the case may be. The disciples were like, yo, can you just like take care of this so she can go away? This woman wanted her daughter to be healed from the torture uh, of a demon, and the only one that can fix the situation, at least on the surface level, ignores the request. He ignores the request. Or was he just testing her? Many of you here in this room and those online, in your living rooms, in your office, in your couch, wherever you are at, maybe you're even in the kitchen uh, listening while you're washing dishes or something. But many of you know what this feels like, right? Many of you have made requests to God. Many of you have asked the Lord for a job. I need work. I need to provide for my family. I need to provide for my, myself. You have requested the Lord for work, for a job. And it feels like, it seems like, he has ignored the request. Or maybe you're here, maybe you're a single person, maybe you're single, you don't have a significant other, and you already dealt with depression, already dealt with anxiety, already dealt with uh, isolation to some degree, and then the pandemic happens, and then it furthers you more into depression, more into anxiety, more into isolation, and you ask the Lord, you request to the Lord, you request to Jesus for community, for fellowship, or whatever the case, and he ignores the request. Or maybe it feels like he ignores the request. Or maybe you're in a marriage right now that is a little bumpy, it's a little rocky, it's a little tough because of whatever the case may be. And you've been requesting to the Lord to fix the situation, to heal this broken marriage, to heal the wife, to heal the husband. And it feels like he has ignored the request. You know what that feels like. You can identify with the Canaanite woman in a real sense. Is he ignoring her? Is he ignoring you? Or maybe is he just testing? Faith that Jesus requires, that he values, is a faith that recognizes him. And secondly, a faith that comes with a posture of humility. It comes with a posture of humility. Now, this is the first time in the story that Jesus speaks, and the words that he says are actually really staggering. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
We all got that friend, right? That friend that maybe want to get really philosophical, really deep, or whatever the case may be, and we ask them a simple question. And then they respond with a confusing answer. This is what Jesus does. <laughs> She's asking for something simple. Can you, can you heal my, 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 my daughter? I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I know she was like, what? Are you serious? First of all, what does that even mean? I think the best way to interpret this verse is, is fourfold. <laughs> A lot more to be said about this, but I think to try to understand it is one, by Jesus claiming to be a shepherd of Israel, in essence, he's claiming the ultimate fulfillment of messianic prophecy. He's claiming the ultimate fulfillment of messianic prophecy. Secondly, I think the lost sheep uh, are those who are the house of Israel. So some people can maybe think about this as some of the sheep that are uh, some of the, the, the sheep that are among the house of Israel, or is it all of Israel? I, I lean towards the latter. I think it's all of Israel, all of God's ancient people. Because, interestingly enough, if you read Jeremiah 50, verse 6. It simply says that God calls Israel, his people, and he calls them lost sheep. They are a sheep without a shepherd. Thirdly, I think we could just make this really, really, really simple. Uh, in ministry, you have priorities, right? There are certain priorities that you would place upon. Even here at Heritage, whether you have children's ministry, whether you have the D3, whether you, whatever you have, there are certain ministries, and each ministry has a priority that you're going to tackle first, right? In Christ's ministry, he starts first with the Jews. In Christ's ministry, his, his, his priority that he first has is among the Jews. John 1 he came from heaven to earth and dwelt among his people, the, the Jewish people, right? And they actually ended up rejecting him. But his priority that he has ultimately is, first and foremost, it's with the Jews. And then it branches out to the nations and other people. Uh, let me make it plain. The Apostle Paul, the great church planner, the great theologian, the great philosopher, when he goes um, and to uh, plant churches, where does he do? He starts with synagogues first. Romans 1.16, great classic verse. I am unashamed of the gospel. <laughs> but to, to the Jew first, then the Greek. See, there's a priority that he is, is doing. I would argue that in, in a sense, Jesus is basically saying that he's, uh, I come to the lost sheep of the house, house of Israel. Uh, uh, priority first is for them, and then it branches off to the nations and everyone else. And fourthly, I think this is just a test for the Canaanite woman. This is a test for the Canaanite woman woman. But how does she respond? She responds with humility. She responds with humility. She kneels down and says, Lord, help me. I want you to look at this image here of this woman. Like she's kneeling here. She, she has a posture of humility. You see, she says, Lord, help me. By the way, this is the second time in the passage so far that she has identified him as Lord. She does it three times total, but interesting observation. She's saying Lord. Again, she's recognizing who he is, and she comes with this posture of humility. This actually mirrors the narrative in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, the one that I mentioned earlier about the girl that was resurrected, the girl that was restored, and the woman that was healed. 
Listen to this. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Kneeling demonstrates the idea of humility. I want to come before you and kneel and sit at your feet and make my requests known to you. Faith requires this posture of humility. When someone comes to faith in Christ, there is a humility that they are actually stepping into. Why? Because to believe in Jesus, to believe in Christ, to believe in this Messiah, you have to understand that you are broken. You need help. <laughs> you need saving. You need rescuing. That takes the ultimate step of humility to actually even admit that, to actually come and sit at Jesus' feet and say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, help me. Humility is a very key, important aspect to the faith that Jesus values. Not arrogance, not pride, but humility. And the ultimate humility we see is demonstrated on the cross of Christ. <laughs> Faith that Jesus values requires you recognize him, requires a posture of humility, and lastly, it requires a faith that is persistent. Faith that is persistent. Jesus continues to test this, this Canaanite woman. I, I think so to, to draw out some greater faith in her to some degree. But this woman will not take no for an answer. I mean, you got to give her some respect. She is like going <laughs> and saying, I'm not stopping until I get what I want. I'm not stopping until my daughter is healed. Mad respect, mad props to her because she keeps going. And then Jesus uses this interesting metaphor that only Jesus can use, talking about it's not right to give bread to dogs. Second aspect that maybe you might think Jesus was a little rude. He ignores her. He's calling her a dog. It appears that Jesus may be using some symbolism here. Um, uh, the bread representing some type of blessing or, or some type of a healing presence, right? Um, as you continue on in Matthew, you'll see how he uh, feeds um, thousands of people with bread. That, that, that bread symbol is very important throughout this gospel, throughout the whole entire Bible, really. really. But I think the bread is, is, is representing something when he says that. I also think that the, um, the children... The word children that he uses here, I think it's representing the Jewish people. I think it's representing, representing Jews. And then dogs, I think he's using that um, to refer to the Gentiles, to refer to people that are not Jewish. Because dogs, again, Gentiles, were considered unclean. So I think there's some, symbol, some interesting symbolism here that, he, that he's using, but this woman comes back with the ultimate clapback. Clapback is when, you know, someone is talking and you say one thing and they say another and you try to raise the bar type of thing. It's called a clapback. Um, she, says, she says this, which I think is very, very interesting. She says, um, basically, it's cool if Gentiles are dogs. Okay, I, I give that to you, Jesus. But we still have the right to be fed. Even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. 
man, that is, uh, if we was listening to some rap music, right, that would be considered bars right there. <laughs> that is, that is bars, yo. Like, that is, that is a punchline that's like, oof. What you going to do about that one, Jesus? Because that's a good one. She says, even dogs have the right to be fed, even if it's just crumbs. My wife and I, we have two dogs, actually, um, Brownie and, and, and Lucy. Um, Brownie um, is the cool one. He's nice. He's, he's chill, yo. Like, if you meet Brownie, like, Brownie's dope. Like, he cool. Lucy, not so much. <laughs> Lucy's a little crazy. She influences Brownie to do bad things. <laughs> I love Brownie. Lucy, she's cool. But many different times, man, we're eating at the dinner table, my wife making amazing food. And um, there's been plenty of times where I'm being, uh, um, I'm making a mess. <laughs> Let's just say that and food is falling all over the ground. And every single time, Brownie and Lucy run right, right up to the, to the table to get the crumbs that are falling all over the table. What this Canaanite woman is saying is, even dogs, even pets in a house, even Brownie and Lucy, can be fed, even if it's crumbs. Jesus' response is intriguing here because it's a reversal of what's, what, he, what he's been saying all along. Great is your faith. Aside from the Satyrian's faith in Matthew 8, this is the only time in the Gospel of Matthew that faith is qualified as great. Remember, different disciples, he says, why do you have little faith? But with this Canaanite woman, he says, great is your faith. In the end, she gets the request of her daughter being healed. In fact, she was healed on the spot. She was healed instantly. This story foreshadows the time when God's people will be grafted into, the Gentiles will be grafted into God's people as the ultimate plan of God on the basis of genuine faith in Christ. My question for you this morning, Heritage, before we close, as we come to a close, What kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith do you possess? Is it an arrogant type of faith? Is it a cocky type of faith? What type of faith do you have? Because the faith that Jesus values and accepts is persistence. It is recognizing him. It is coming with a posture of humility. And the gospel message is simply good news. It's good news of the kingdom. It's good news that anybody, no matter what their past has been, can be reconciled to God. They can be made new. They can be made a new creation in Christ upon genuine belief in this Messiah. It's like coming with this posture that the Canaanite woman has to believe in this Jesus. The gospel is good news. It's good news to those who are in need of saving. And I want to submit to you that we all need rescue. We all need to be healed. <laughs> we all need to be restored because we have lust issues in our heart. Because we may have prejudice in our heart. Because we need not honor God the way that we, that we should. I submit to you to repent and believe in the death, the burial, res the, the death, burial, and resurrection of King Jesus. Because he's the only one that's able 
to heal you, to restore you, <laughs> to resurrect you with new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, be persistent in your prayer life. I want to encourage you in that. Be persistent in your prayer life, even when you are discouraged. And trust me, many different times you will get discouraged, just like this Canaanite woman. Be persistent in your prayer life. The scripture says, pray without ceasing. Be persistent in your prayer life. Understand, too, that Jesus has a universal mission. Yes, he has a priority, starting with the Jews and then branching out from that. But the gospel call is to all nations, all different people groups, all different ethnic groups. Remember, Jesus, a Palestinian Jew, is talking and healing a Canaanite woman, a Canaanite woman's daughter. Different, different cultures, different ethnic backgrounds. The gospel crosses over ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Jesus has a universal, universal mission. You can see this even in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Jesus has a universal mission. And lastly, Heritage Church, before I leave, I want you to know and be encouraged to have genuine faith in Messiah Jesus, knowing he's the only one able to answer your requests. And the church said, amen. amen. Let me pray. Father God, I want to pray specifically for somebody here right now that have been praying for a miracle in their lives. They've been praying for healing. And maybe like this Canaanite woman, it just hasn't come yet. Whether it's sickness, whether it's with a friend, whether it's with a family, whatever it may be, Lord, we know that you're omniscient, meaning you're all-knowing, you know all, you see all. I pray that this church can be a praying church, a persistent praying church, making their requests made known to you. And I pray that you give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray that you can show and reveal yourself to them. All these things we ask and we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.